I'm here to talk about um, spirituality and science coming together again. Uh, I tend to look at the year 1600 as a very decisive year. That's the year that the Catholic Church burned Giordano Bruno uh, at the stake for daring to bring the new science, Copernicus, into, uh, into theology and religion. Bruno, like myself, had been a Dominican, uh, as was uh, Thomas Aquinas and Meister Eckhart. And it was Aquinas who said that a mistake about creation results in a mistake about God. And I would just uh, add to that, that would mean that an insight about creation results to an insight about God. And there, I think, is, is found part of the nobility of the scientific enterprise to, to unpack for us uh, more of the truth and the beauty and the wisdom of creation is to unpack uh, a deeper relationship with, um, with that which is behind creation. A number of years ago, I had a very important dream, and it said to me this one sentence. It said... There's nothing wrong with the human species today except one thing. Now, I think that's quite an amazing sentence because if I asked you to take out a piece of paper and pencil, I bet you could come up with about 100 things that's wrong with the human species today. There's nothing wrong with the human species today except one thing. You have forgotten the sense of the sacred. That was a dream. And um, I think that this cuts through our religions, our education, our science, our media, our politics, our economics. What does it mean? Where do we recover the sense of the sacred again? It is in nature. It is from being struck by the beauty and the awesomeness of our existence. And the new creation story we're getting from science, that the universe began smaller than a zygote, has been growing ever since that we're all of us on a 13.8 billion year journey. This is the beginning of the re-sacralizing uh, of our existence. And this split that we've had, I think when Giordano Bruno was burned, there was a truce worked out between religion and science in the West. Scientists said, hey, these believers, they can be kind of dangerous. Let's work a truce. Why don't you believers take the soul and we'll take the universe? And I think an Augustinian attitude toward nature uh, set theologians up to say, okay, good deal. But what happened is the human soul became sillier and sillier and more and more neurotic as it was cut off from the cosmos. And science, meanwhile, became more and more powerful as it discovered the power of, of um, atomic energy and the rest. But it, it limped when it came to conscience. It was very set up to sell its soul to corporations, to defense departments, departments, and all the rest. So that's how I see, in, in a nutshell, the, the recent history in the modern era. But this is a postmodern time. And all kinds of things are shifting, both within science and within some corners of uh, religion and spirituality. So this is what I want to do. I want to pose four areas in which I see science and spirituality truly feeding each other at this time. And these four areas that I'm talking about are archetypal. I call them the four paths of creation spirituality. It's what the non-dualistic tradition, the mystics, talk about. The first area is the via positiva, the experience of awe and wonder. Rabbi Heschel calls it radical amazement. And so I ask this question is part of the scientist's task to flood us with stories of awe and wonder. In doing so, they are nurturing, feeding our, our mystical souls. Just a very recent example. Two weeks ago, we got the news that the universe is not 100 billion galaxies big, it's 2 trillion galaxies big. Now, if the top of your head doesn't come off and you hear that, you've been watching too much television <laughs> and far too many presidential debates. <laughs> Two trillion galaxies, we can't even begin to count the number of stars, the number of planets. 
How long will it take us to work on this and to let this truth work on us? All of it. Now, you know, there's kind of like two responses. One is, oh, we're, we humans, we're so insignificant, we're nothing but a grain of sand, blah, 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 and feel sorry for ourselves, which patriarchy teaches us to do, self-pity. But the other response is, wow, this is awesome. And what's awesome is that our minds are so big and our hearts that we can connect to two trillion galaxies. We can say it. It's in language now. It's in science. It's got to get into our plays, into our drama, into our music, into our dance, into our ritual. What a gift from science. And that's just one example of the awesome truths that come to all people, from atheists to Muslims to Jews to Christians, all people. Because as I wrote in my Cosmic Christ book years ago, there's no such thing as a Roman Catholic rainforest and a Lutheran sun and a Baptist moon and a Buddhist ocean and an atheist cornfield. Once humans begin to make creation, nature, the center of our lives again, which is what you do if you're serious about the sacred, then our souls are set up for more and more awe, stories of awe and wonder. Thomas Berry says, eventually, only a sense of the sacred will save us. Only a sense of the sacred will save us. And there are so many stories tumbling out of science that do all that for us. Now, my most recent book is on the great Catholic monk uh, Thomas Merton, who died in 1968. In fact, I can prove that he was murdered by the CIA. That's, uh, that's I can prove. But um, he, um, he talks about the He's so good at putting into language what our mystical experiences are. So I want to share with you just a few words of his about the experience of the Via Positiva. Because this is where non-dualism, where dualism is overcome in our mystical experiences with the beauty of, of nature within us and around us. For example, he, he says that uh, every plant that stands in the light of the sun is a saint and an outlaw. I love that combination, be saint and outlaw. Every tree that brings forth blossoms without the command of man is powerful in the sight of God. Every blade of grass is an angel singing in a shower of glory. And in his journal he writes, dance in this sun, you tepid idiot. Wake up and dance in the clarity of perfect contradiction. You fool, it is life that makes you dance. Have you forgotten? Now, Merton took six years to convince his abbot that he could live in a hermitage on the monastery property. And he wrote this about his experience in the hermitage. And it's a beautiful passage about the marriage, the, the sacred marriage of the cosmos and the human psyche. I live in the woods out of necessity. I get out of bed in the middle of the night because it is imperative that I hear the silence of the night alone and with my face on the floor say psalms alone in the silence of the night. The silence of the forest is my bride and the sweet dark warmth of the whole world is my love. And out of the heart of that dark warmth comes a secret that is heard only in silence. But it is the root of all the secrets that are whispered by all the lovers in their beds all over the world. It's a beautiful passage of the cosmic night and the cosmic darkness and silence blessing individuals in our beds and in our acts of love. This is a, an example of what happens we, when we can reconnect our, our understanding of the cosmos with the human psyche because we are, as Thomas Aquinas said, all of us, Kapax University, capable of the universe. Now, the second path where science and spirituality can truly meet today and feed one another is the, what the mystics call the via negativa. This is a path of darkness, the path of the apophatic divinity. Meister Eckhart says, God is super essential darkness who has no name and will never be given a name. 
The Buddhists are very big on the epiphatic divinity, but so too there's a very strong tradition in Christianity, and Meister Eckhart is the best representative of that. Now, I think this is of extreme importance because at this time we're hearing that 97 or 98 percent of all the matter in the universe is dark matter or dark energy, and we're not sure what that means. So we are exploring all that. Science is exploring all that. But to realize that this is part of the mystical journey in a very profound way means that science and spirituality are working together again, or ought to be, precisely in that area. And there are several concrete stories. If you read the stories of many astronauts and cosmonauts who went up into space, they came back mystics. And they all say the same thing. It was the silence and the darkness of space. Now, of course, there were no spiritual directors at NASA, so many of them went kind of crazy and ran for political office or something. But that doesn't discount that they had a mystical experience that utterly changed their lives. And that experience was precisely an experience of the darkness and the silence, the via negativa of the mystics. And, of course, the, the earth shone as this light, this gem with all the darkness surrounding it. Of course, we also know about the dark night of the soul. I believe that today our species is in a dark night, a dark night of the species. And it's important to understand that the mystics have a lot to teach us about this. It's a very important thing to stick around for the dark night. It's not easy. Hafiz, the great 14th century Sufi mystic, says, sometimes God wants to do us a great favor, turn us upside down and shake all the nonsense out. But most people I know, he says, when they hear God is in such a playful, drunken mood, quickly pack their bags and hightail it out of town. <laughs> we don't want to stick around for the lessons to be learned from this dark night. And yet we are in it as a species because we do not know how we're going to pull out of this dive that we are in. But there is so much to learn, and the mystics are telling us, don't pack your bags and hightail it out of town. Don't get drunk and intoxicated on drugs, alcohol, television, and the rest. Rather stick around. Keep your soul present to what we're being instructed in at this time. Because out of the darkness comes so much breakthrough. It is a gestation period. It is a time of creativity. And that takes us to the third path, that of the via creativa, of creativity. I always say that if anything distinguishes the Einsteinian and post-Einsteinian universe from Newton's, it's creativity. When we were taught for a couple hundred years the universe was a machine, that means it's done. You've got to fit in. But it's not a machine. The nearest thing to the universe is an organism. It started smaller than a zygote. And so creativity has been here from the get-go. The fireball birthed. The, the, the hydrogen atoms and, and the neutron atoms of Earth to get things going. And it's been an am amazing journey ever since. It's still going on. And we're here besides to talk about it, to praise it, to wonder, to explore. So creativity is at the very heart of the universe. Therefore, we have all this permission as human beings again to realize that creativity is a spiritual practice. It is a spiritual practice. The hours and hours, the sweat, the discipline that scientists put into learning to be a good scientist or that artists put or musicians into learning to be good musicians and artists, farmers the same, carpenters the same, all of the arts. And we have to break out of this modern notion that some people are artists and others aren't. As David Pallet in the Navajo Painter says, I'm sick and tired of hearing white people tell me they're not artists. If you can talk, you're an artist, he said, because you're translating your deepest passions and feelings into language that's an art form. So we're all part of this incredible drama now of two trillion galaxies unfolding, developing, coming alive. And you know and I know, when you are in a creative state, you're not looking at your watch. You're in another time and place. It's a mystical experience. And we have this word, 
muse. The muse is an angel who shows up for your creative uh, uh, processes at the time of your creative work. And uh, this corresponds exactly with what Thomas Aquinas says about angels. That angels learn only by intuition, he says. So as we tap into our intuitive brains, what Einstein said is our sacred gift, the brain that is a sacred gift as distinct from the rational brain, that's Einstein's words. As we tap into our intuitive brain, you're going to meet angels and spirits hitchhiking on the highway of intuition. Expect it. I met Lorna Byrne recently. I interviewed her at Grace Cathedral. 1,300 people came because they've read her work. This lady has been experiencing angels from the time she was two years old. She says, there are a lot of unemployed angels in the world today. I said, oh my God, I said, I know a lot of unemployed people. Do we have to put angels to work too? She said, God knows how much trouble humans are in today and is pouring angels on the earth to help us, but no one's asking them for help. It's precisely in the Via Creativa, what we have to give birth to, alternative forms of energy, of education, of politics, of economics, of religion, of worship, the, the spirits are eager to, to feed us. We're not alone. We're not just, let's get over our, what Pope Francis rightly calls our narcissism as a species and realize that there are many levels of beings that, uh, that want to work on our behalf to, uh, to, to, to result in a more, in a more healthy uh, and, and more advanced uh, uh, civilization and time on Earth. Thomas Aquinas talks this way about creativity. He says, the same spirit that hovered over the waters at the beginning of creation hovers over the mind of the artist at work. That is so beautiful. The, the, the spirit of creativity that launched all this creation and is still doing so, this is the same spirit that visits you and me and your colleagues when we're involved in works of creativity. That is no small thing. <clears throat> and finally, the Via Transformativa. This is a path of justice and of compassion, the path of healing and of celebration. How does science assist us in this regard? Well, first of all, with facts. For example, the facts about climate change. I was at a conference in January in Florida about the seas rising. And um, the first speaker was a scientist. He got up and had a map of Florida then he showed up a map of Florida 10 years from now, chop. 20 years from now, chop, chop. 30 years from now, chop, chop, chop. All I can say is I wouldn't invest in real estate in Florida. Maybe rubber boots, but not real estate, folks. Now, at that time in Florida, in January, there were three major politicians in Florida, the governor, the acting governor, and two others running for president of the United States who were in complete denial about climate change, global warming, and seas rising. Even though I visited South Miami and there was already six inches on the sidewalk. So after this guy lectured, everyone was so depressed. It was my turn to talk. And everyone was like, like a <laughs> wet dish rag. So I, I threw out my notes. And instead I talked about denial. Denial is a spiritual problem because we humans are so good at it. We can rationalize till we're dead. And there's a great line from Meister Eckhart, God is the denial of denial. Only when we can get over denial can truth enter the room. As long as we're in denial, we're nowhere near uh, the sacred. We're nowhere near the sacred. Denial is a choice to be ignorant. It's a choice to be ignorant of something important. So the whole question of evil comes in here. How many other areas of denial is our culture uh, embedded in at this time? And so this is where we need the facts from science, but we also need spirituality to address the, the soul capacity for deceiving itself, for wallowing in ignorance, and, uh, and honoring idols that we may call ideological uh, purity whether of a political club 
or a religious club or some other club that were so capable of idol worship. We forget that. Thomas Merton writes about how the, he says the, uh, we, we are involved in, a, in an unbelievable orgy, orgy of idolatry whenever religious fundamentalism and uh, right-wing politics link up. The issue, he says, is, is that it's an orgy of, of idolatry. So um, here too then, uh, spirituality and, uh, and science uh, link up. Now, something about Thomas Burton uh, needs to be said, and here in Silicon Valley, it really needs to be had, said and listened to. And that is that um, uh, he has a poem I want to share with you, and then an observation. This is his wonderful poem called uh, First Lesson About Man. Man begins in zoology. Now, that's his affirmation of evolution, of course. He is the saddest animal. He drives a big red car called anxiety. Whenever he goes to the phone to call joy, he gets the wrong number. <laughs> Therefore, he likes weapons. He knows all guns by their right names. He drives a big black Cadillac called death. Now he is putting anxiety into space. He fills he flies his worries all around Venus, but it does him no good. Man is the saddest animal. He begins in zoology and gets lost in his own bad news. To me, that is vintage Merton for its humor, but also for its depth and its challenge. But the big technological gee whiz event of his time was getting to the moon. Everyone was talking in the 60s about getting to the moon. And they got there a year after Merton died. But he took a, a critical stance about that, and this is what he said. Even if we can fly, so what? There are flying ants. Even if humans fly all over the universe, we are still nothing but a flying ant until we recover a human center and a human spirit in the depth of our own being. What can we gain by sailing to the moon if we are not able to cross the abyss that separates us from ourselves? This is the most important of all voyages of discovery. Without it, all the rest are not only useless, but disastrous. Now, we've been to the moon a couple times and all that. But today, of course, the big technological excitement is happening here in Silicon Valley. And uh, the problem is that if you check it out, ISIS takes every invention from Silicon Valley and applies it to their dark purposes. The young man who murdered 50 gay people and wounded another 50 in the club in Florida, Orlando, he was on Facebook and texting while he was machine gunning these victims. So what's evident is that humanity is not going to be saved by technology. And Rabbi Heschel said this decades ago. Rabbi Heschel said humanity will not be saved by more information, but by more appreciation. That's the via positiva you see. That's that gratitude we get to be here in the context of all this wonder and this amazing journey we've been on for 13.8 billion years. That is the spiritual dimension of being a human being. Gratitude, reverence comes from gratitude and from our experiences of awe. So I think that Silicon Valley should consider the following. I think they should tax themselves, a very small tax, under 1%. Not the government should tax them, but Silicon Valley should volunteer to tax itself to explore exactly what Merton was talking about, to support those groups and movements. Because I don't know one spiritual movement, including my own, that could not use some cash. I mean it. It's a reality. And the religions, the churches and all, they're not supporting this. They're threatened by it too. 
but a small tax on, them, on their many profits to support things like the cosmic mass because ritual is so important for the psyche and the cosmos connecting again. That's where the energy is going to come from. Think about Stonehenge. What inspired these people thousands of years ago before the wheel was invented to drag thousand pound rocks for miles? What got them out of their couch couches and ceasing uh, being addicted to television to do this? It was the solstice and the equinox. It was a passion in the human soul to connect to the universe and its marvelous goings on. This is what true ritual does. This is why indigenous ritual is so powerful. Because the indigenous people have never lost faith with the sense of the cosmic, the sacred cosmos. Einstein said, the future of humanity depends on a cosmic religion grounded in conscience. We have to move beyond our sectarian boxes of religious difference. And we have to, together, bring forth the wisdom of East and West, indigenous and other, precisely as it relates to the sacredness of the universe. In the West, in Christianity, this archetype is called the cosmic Christ. And I've just written my second book on the cosmic Christ called The Stations of the Cosmic Christ to balance the old stations of the cross. And two wonderful artists have contributed to this. We have these stations. You can look it up. But um, in the East, it's called the Buddha nature. The Buddha nature. That every being is another Buddha. That's what the cosmic Christ is about. Every being is another Christ. We're all other Christs. That implies both our dignity and our responsibility. And just recently, there was a new book by a, a Jewish scholar, Rabbi David Cederman, who I met at a Sundance three years ago, about the tradition of the image of God in Judaism. And he went through the whole tradition and concluded the image of God is not just about human beings in Judaism. It's about every being in the universe. So we're gathering these stories from all our spiritual traditions about how our ancestors understood this is the basis of a true ecological movement, an ecological shift in humanity. Remember what Thomas Berry says, ecology is functional cosmology. So the recovery of cosmos and the recovery of the sacredness of, of the ecosystem and our planet and ourselves, all this can and will happen together. And of course, the ritual is so important because there is where we gather all our art in what we do in the cosmic mass. We've got VJs and DJs and rappers and poets um, and, and so many artists, musicians show up because they're dying to be asked to do more than just lead a dance. They want to be invited into that level of worship where all of us can, can grieve together, very important to grieve together today, and to share our joy together and our beauty in order to, to bring alive our powerful uh, capacity for courage and for uh, carrying on the struggle. We're called to be both mystics and prophets. The mystic in all of us is a lover. The prophet is one who stands up to defend what one cherishes. I think to be alive today, you have to fall in love at least three times a day. And don't consider this a threat to your marriage. Falling in love means falling in love with other species too. With trees, with fishes, with elephants, with polar bears, with rainforests, with whales, with oceans and rivers, with rocks. They're all being threatened today. And we're in denial if we think otherwise. And this is an integral part of our task in bringing science and spirituality together. That and grieving. I did a grieving ceremony for 800 people uh, from all traditions at a Sounds True conference a few years ago. And afterwards, a man came up to me and said, I've been seeing a psychiatrist for 21 years. I'm firing her on Monday. He said, all I needed, really needed was this grieving ceremony. I believe the churches and the synagogues have utterly left us abandoned when it comes to the importance of, 
of grief today because people are carrying so much grief, but we're not dealing with it. And therefore, we're carrying anger around inside of us. And a lot of these people are, are Trump folks because anger is the first level of grief. And if we're not dealing with grief in an explicit way as communities, then we're all going to be bottled up with anger instead of going deeper into our true sorrow and then ultimately into, into letting go. So these are a few thoughts I wanted to share um, about religion and spirituality coming together today. I think it is a landmark moment in the history of our species, in the history of this planet, and we cannot afford to fumble this opportunity. And I, I am so grateful to Sands for having its, its perspective on this uh, all these years, inviting so many wonderful speakers and participants in gatherings like this. We need a lot more like them because uh, to recover a sense of the sacred means that we overcome the dualism between psyche and cosmos, between religion and science, and that we challenge our religions to put spirituality first and to let go of a lot of the religious accretions that we really don't need anymore. We don't have to travel with basilicas on our back anymore. Backpacks will do. But the backpacks should contain the powerful mystics and the powerful prophets of all our tradition who are all cheering for us and wanting to urge us to be as beautiful and as courageous as they were. May you be among those yourselves. Thank you.